Imagine for a second, someone hires you in an industry or a job that you're interested in, even though you have no experience in it, and then promises you that you will run the company someday soon. Hey guys, it's Brandon, and as you may have seen in some of my previous videos, I recently spent three months in Barcelona. But before that happened, I quit a job that promised me a life, a career of security, money, support, and rare opportunity. I left that behind and instead chose to work without pay in a hostel in Spain and then live in my car when I got back to the US. Why on earth would someone choose to do that? Well, I wanna share with you all of the details of a very personal story to me. It's part of the life journey that I'm on right now and so it's still open-ended and I don't know what all of the outcomes of my choices will be. First, let me give you a little backstory. This was in like 2014, I think. I had just decided to leave a partnership that I formed with a friend. I had brought him on board with a photo booth idea in which we would offer our photo booth services to weddings and corporate events and things like that. We were picking up steam and making more and more money, but the partnership just wasn't working out. I won't go into too much detail here, but eventually it got to the point where I felt like I had to walk away because I couldn't continue with this partnership and we were in it 50-50. After that time, I just made it known that I was lost and that I wanted to meet new people, get new ideas, new inspiration. One of my best friends told me that he wanted me to meet his mentor. His mentor was in the real estate industry, was a very special person to him, and was someone who enjoyed meeting and talking to young people working their way through life. So we met for breakfast and we had a great conversation, so much so that we agreed to meet again for lunch. Now I wasn't trying to get anything from this person except making an honest, genuine human connection and just enjoying a sincere conversation. But after that lunch, we met one more time. And on that third meeting, he asked me if I would be interested in working for his company. He owned a small property management company. They managed shopping centers, office buildings, apartments and industrial warehouses for their clients. The job entailed reading through leases, networking with real estate brokers, hiring contractors to maintain the properties, working with tenants and working with the clients who were the landlords. It was basically a full education into the real estate investment world. And what's more, he told me what his intentions were. He was in his 70s, he had built this company from nothing over 30 years ago, and he personally owned some of the buildings that the company looked after. He wanted someone he could trust, someone that he had personally taught to eventually take over the company, take care of his employees, and manage his family's assets as if they were their own. From the get-go, he told me that I would intern for him for a bit, then become a full-time employee, learn the ropes, and eventually start building what he called sweat equity in the company. That is, I would gain portions of ownership of the company through my work. When he was ready to let go of the reins, the ownership of the company would be passed on to me. Given his age, this could mean I could potentially own a successful, established property management company that was simply passed on to me by the time I was about 35. Where do you find an opportunity like that? And with all of that being said, why would somebody walk away from that opportunity? Well, before I get into the reasons, let me just say that it was a solid three and a half years I spent with this company, and a lot happened during those three and a half years. So much so that it would simply take too long to go through each of the individual events that eventually brought me to this point. This also is not a sob story or an attempt at getting sympathy. Uh, this was an extremely special part of my life and one that I am so grateful for, but I feel like I need to go through the reasons why I decided to leave before ending this video with some major perspective that I gained. This video is as much for me as it is for anybody else that might be going through something similar where they're deciding if they should leave the security of their job to follow something else that's in their heart. So reason number one, I never felt like I was good at it. Now I know what you're probably thinking, three and a half years really isn't that long in the scope of an entire career. And just because you're not good at it in the first three years doesn't mean that you should give up. Well, hear me out and listen to the other reasons in the rest of this video, and then you can make a judgment for yourself. From day one, I was so grateful for the opportunity that this person was giving me. To be completely honest with you, I didn't even know if I really believed him and what he was promising because it almost sounded too good to be true. But nonetheless, I knew that I had ran into someone that was willing to teach me something valuable. And so I told myself that I was just going to work and I was going to learn. I wanted to be the last one to leave the office every day and I wanted to soak up everything like a sponge. I knew that it would be challenging and I knew that I was starting from the ground up. There would be a lot of trial and error, a lot of mistakes made, lessons learned, studying, observing, 
and just plain work. But again, I was grateful for this experience and I was willing to learn everything that I could. Now, while most properties in our company's portfolio were well-established buildings that had been running pretty smoothly for years, I was given the unique task of working with buildings that had just recently been purchased by our clients and were what you might call fixer-uppers. These were rundown buildings with deteriorating and outdated exteriors, tenants that were paying rental rates from 10 years ago, and even homeless encampments in the parking lots. They were purposefully bought at a discount so that we could go through them, fix all of the problems, and then sell them at higher prices. Now, one approach to training a new employee like myself might be to put them on the well-established properties that run like clockwork so that they can get a feel for how everything works with the easy stuff before giving them the unique challenges. But I didn't question it. If this is what my company needed from me, then I was going to learn, I was gonna ask plenty of good questions, and I was going to hustle and just work my way through it. In those early days, I remember setting up meetings with contractors to go through all of the things that needed to be fixed, work out design upgrades, and get prices and quotes. The only thing was I knew nothing about construction. I pretended to know what a facade was, where the main plumbing line ran, how a grease trap worked, and what the difference between a header and a beam was. And the thing was, I didn't even know that I needed to know these things until I was there meeting and talking with these people. Now you have to understand, my dilemma was that I could ask a bazillion questions and admit to not knowing things, which is often the respectable and mature thing to do. But in the moment, I felt like I would not just be making myself look bad, I would be making my company look bad as well. These contractors did not want to waste any time and I'm sure that they could already sense that I didn't know anything. There was another occasion when my company gained the business of a new client and I had to interact with the property manager that they were firing so that we can transition everything over. As you can probably imagine, this person was not happy that his 15 year job was being given to some incompetent kid and he was not shy about letting me know that I didn't know anything and that my company didn't either. But the upsetting thing to me was he was kind of right, at least about me. I didn't know a lot of things that he was talking about, but by association, it meant that my company didn't either. And because each building, each tenant, each issue is unique in its own right, over the course of the three years at this job, I always felt like this. I would be at City Hall and the head building planner would be asking me why I didn't come with an engineer who would at least know what he's talking about. I would be meeting with leasing agents, which if you don't know, are often type A salesmen, the kind that love you if you're the guy that owns the buildings and has all the money, but think that you're a chump if you're just an employee, the kind that simply wants to close deals fast. And if your incompetence extends the amount of time that it takes for them to get their commission checks, then you need to be replaced. So I'd have to meet with these people and pretend like I knew ahead of time what the rentable square footage versus the usable square footage was, how many tons the HVAC unit was, and what the city's parking requirements for the parking lot were. Basically, until the last day that I was working, I felt like I was still in the fake it till you make it phase. And during all of this time, I was listening to a lot of self-help type stuff online. You know, stuff from guys like Tony Robbins and speeches from successful entrepreneurs and things like that. And one theme that showed up a lot was do something that you're already good at instead of trying to be good at things that you're not. In other words, focus on your strengths. And in this job, I definitely did not feel strong. I did a lot to stay positive and I still had a lot of respect for myself, but in the end, if I were to be completely honest with myself, I just did not feel like I was good at this. Reason number two, I didn't feel like I was adding value to anyone. Well, from the first reason in this video, it's probably pretty obvious why I didn't feel like I was adding value to my boss, my company, or the various vendors and contractors I had to work with. But I felt like this even extended to our clients and to the tenants. Let me explain. Firstly, our clients. I felt like my incompetence and inability to learn fast enough or to know what to learn fast enough was costing our clients. Throughout my time here, I felt like a more experienced property manager could get things done quicker and cheaper, plain and simple. And although this is going to be the case for any job in which you're new, I just felt like if this is where I was meant to be, then it should be clicking by now. I even had a client who I got along really well with. He would often take me out to lunch and say that he normally refuses lunch invitations from other people all of the time 
including people that can make him a lot of money. Essentially, he was a mentor to me, and just like my boss, he was one of the most patient people that I've ever met. When I had to deliver bad news about a delay in a construction project or complications with a tenant, I would often be very surprised by how understanding he was. I remember thinking that in a different company with different clients and a different boss, it would be completely reasonable for these people to chew me out, ask me why things are taking so long, and threaten to get someone else. But these people cared more about letting me learn than getting immediate results. It was crazy, it was inspiring, and I am so beyond grateful and humbled for that experience. But still, even this client admitted that he knew, quite frankly, that he could have hired another property manager with decades of experience who could have gotten things done in half the time. Again, I am so grateful for his trust and his kindness, but I felt like I could not return his generosity with results. And this really got to me. Now, as far as the tenants go, as you might imagine, being a property manager puts you in an interesting situation. On one hand, you represent the landlord and you're looking out for their best interest. But on the other hand, you're on the ground floor talking to tenants, hearing their concerns, and handling their issues on a daily basis. So it was a challenge for me to go into these places where again, the tenants had not been paying current market rates for many years and collect rent from them and tell them that the rates were going up. I remember one issue that came about when we started managing this one small shopping plaza. Apparently, this new tenant was forced to close their doors until they could resolve some building code issues. The issue was that they said their leasing agent told them that everything was ready to go when they moved in. They hadn't anticipated that they would have to make all of these renovations and get everything approved by the city. Now, the actions of the leasing agent were fuzzy and they were no longer involved with this building. But it is true that new businesses are responsible for going through the city's process of obtaining a permit to be open for business. This permit in itself costs a lot of money, but so do the renovations that are required to get the permit in the first place. The landlord tried to help them out with some free rent, but after that, this tenant was essentially paying rent on a space that they could not even utilize. Normally, new businesses factor this into their expenses of opening up, but these just were not very experienced business people. They tried to fix the issues, but they had problems with their contractor leaving the country, among other things. And the business owners didn't speak English very well, so I would communicate mostly with their son. They would ask me to help them out with their rent, but of course this wasn't up to me. I would be talking to the son on the phone and he would be translating for his mother, who would be crying in the background, saying that they were doing everything that they could do. I eventually learned that the son had to leave his family and move out of state for a job opportunity that could help him pay for his family's business debts. And I learned that the family had taken out some loans from other relatives to cover rent until their issues with the city were resolved. So on one hand, I had sympathy and empathy for these tenants who may not have been the best business people, but were facing some very real financial and now family challenges that would probably hang over their heads for years. And every time I received a phone call from someone, they would be crying. On the other hand, I was looking out for the best interests of our clients. Our clients, by the way, were actually all very conscientious and empathetic people. This kind of surprised me in the beginning because I imagine landlords might be very cutthroat and profit driven, but all of the clients that we had were actually very respectful and cared a lot about their tenants. But they were also very good business people. And to a good business person, at some point, things need to be about business and sympathy can only extend so far. The landlords were in the business of having tenants that were willing and able to pay as high of a rental rate as possible. And so my challenge was to build relationships with the tenants and to listen to them, to care about them as people and not just see them as a rent check, while at the same time disconnecting myself enough to tell them, you need to pay your rent. It's your responsibility to fix this. You sign the lease and promise to abide by all of these terms. We're not responsible for how slow your business is or whether some hardships in your family are causing you to pay late. If you don't pay, I will have to deliver a notice to evict you. And yes, I had to deliver the eviction notices by hand, which is not fun. So with all of that being said in reason number one and number two, at the end of the day, I didn't feel like I was bringing value to my company to our clients, to the vendors and contractors, or to our tenants. Reason number three, I didn't enjoy the details of the job. 
Towards the end of my time at this job, I was really focusing my thoughts on being more in the present moment in my life and being grateful for the things that truly matter. I started meditating. I made a conscious effort to take my hands off of my phone whenever I was talking to someone face to face so that I could give them my undivided attention. I was learning all these things and trying to put them into practice. And as you may know, in the last year that I was working there, I had a blood clot in my leg, which is a life-threatening issue that can lead to strokes or coughing up blood and things like that. So on the one hand, this job provided me with health insurance, which obviously I was so grateful to have. But on the other hand, it also really made me think, am I spending most of my waking hours on things that actually matter to me? Is my energy being used on things that bring me joy? Now, while in general, long-term ambition of building a living for myself certainly does require a certain amount of energy and is very important to me, my energy just felt like it was being sucked away by such seemingly insignificant and quite frankly, annoying things. The work of a property manager, I realized, is a vastly underappreciated one. So many different issues pop up every day that each day brings with it its own unique challenges and your work never really feels done. The stress of one emergency is often amplified by the stress of another one happening at the same time, but at a different building or with a different tenant. And as those issues are being resolved, those stresses often bleed directly into new stresses from new problems with new tenants at other buildings. What's more is that you're technically on call 24 seven. I can remember a time when I would be at home or out at dinner with a friend and I would get a call from the fire department because this was the third time that a tenant had accidentally set off the fire alarm in the whole building when they were doing some remodeling. I'd have to call the tenant, walk them through how to reset the fire alarm in the utility room, and then I had to call a neighboring tenant to go over there and do the same thing for an alarm that was inside their restaurant because if both alarms weren't reset at the same time, then they would just go off again in another 15 minutes. Or there would be countless weekends, usually on Sundays when I'd be out camping or something, where I would get a call from a tenant saying, the trash company didn't pick up the trash today, and now the dumpsters are overflowing, the floor is wet, there are flies everywhere, and it's starting to stink. You need to take care of this right now. So I'd have to find a vendor that could get over there really quickly and haul away all of the trash for a special fee, and then I would call the trash company, and they would tell me that it wasn't picked up because the bins were too heavy or the lids weren't fully closed. Or maybe I would get a call from a tenant that was being bothered by some homeless people that were sitting around the property drinking alcohol and they wanted me to get rid of them. I once tried calling the police on one of them uh, that was shouting and making threats and things like that but it took the police over an hour to get there, at which time the person left. This is the part of the story where it definitely can start to feel really naggy and like just a bunch of complaining. So I would just leave those examples there. All I can say is that these issues got me to the point where every time I would feel my phone vibrate in my pocket, a flash of anxiety would hit me. I knew that when my phone rang, it was not gonna be for some great chat with a good friend, and it was not likely that it was an important family emergency that I needed to attend to. No, I could be at home, I could be with family, I could be trying to clear my head in nature, but I would feel that vibration from my phone and I knew that it was likely some dumb issue that just didn't need to be happening, but nonetheless had to be fixed right away because it was my job. Honestly, it tore me up inside. And the thought of solidifying this into my life as the owner of the property management company definitely gave me some hesitation. The fourth and last reason I felt like I had to leave simply was that my head was somewhere else. I would be working with all of these issues and making all of these phone calls and in between, I would just be thinking about where I wanted to travel to next, what adventures I wanted to have, which parts of the world I wanted to see. I would just crave that next experience that was invigorating, that was special, that made you feel alive. I had just gotten through a deadly blood clot and it just, it made me feel like I wanted to scale a mountain and take advantage of the fact that I wasn't on blood thinners anymore. Yet, as we all know, here in the US, the typical vacation is only two weeks long and this job was on call 24 seven. I thought about all of the things that I wanted to do in this lifetime and to me, it just seemed impossible to do even a fraction of it with only two weeks every year. Sure, if I owned the company, I could set my own hours and hire managers to run it for me. But let's face it, being a business owner often entails working more than anyone else, at least in the beginning. Now, I'm not necessarily opposed to that, but if I'm going to be trading the days of opportunity that could be spent living an adventure and becoming a citizen of the world, then I better love everything about the work that I'm doing. Even the challenging stuff, 
even the tedious stuff. And with that ownership comes a multiplied amount of responsibility and legal liability. So again, that trade-off better bring joy to my life. Lastly, as it was, the company, the office, the employees all resided in the city where I grew up. It's a great city. It's a beautiful city. It's close to just about everything in Southern California. But quite frankly, I still don't know if this is where I want to be for the rest of my life. As it is, I'm trying really hard right now to get out of here, explore more of the world, and feel what it's like to settle in somewhere else. It's why I spent three months in Barcelona recently. I felt like continuing down this path would solidify my hometown as the place where I would be for the rest of my life. And that thought brought me fear. Now let me switch gears a bit and give you two reasons why I did stay as long as I did, because I think those are very important to understand too. It can be easy to fall into a spiral of always complaining, always seeing the negative and losing sight of what you're fortunate to have. There is no question, this job, this opportunity was incredible. Sure, there was a lot that I didn't like about it, but I'm so fortunate to have even been given this opportunity. Someone coming up to you and telling you that they want to teach you and give you a successful, established, lucrative business is perhaps a once in a lifetime thing. I know that, and the people that I worked with, from my boss, to my coworkers, to our clients, were all so amazing and gracious to me. But still, I had these ever-present thoughts that I needed to move on to something else, that I wanted creativity in my work, that I should be building on skills that I already have, and that I wanna keep traveling. I don't wanna get stuck here. Then this little voice would come into my head and say things like, you know, this opportunity is setting you up for a stable financial future. You have the opportunity to make more money than anyone else in your family. This business could lead to your own real estate deals, to partnerships. You could eventually become a landlord and build wealth for yourself. And then it dawned on me. All of the reasons I was giving myself for staying were about money. And all the reasons for leaving were about fulfillment. Above all, I was afraid that I could become the type of person that lets money be the driving factor in their life. That I would forego all of the other aspects that I wanted out of my life just for a single opportunity for a stable income. That I would be someone who traded their time for money, even though it meant spending at least eight hours of every day doing something that they don't want to be doing. As the great influencer Jim Rohn once said, time is more valuable than money. You can get more money, but you can't get more time. And don't get me wrong, I think about money all the time. Right now, I can safely say that I am the poorest that I've ever been, and I'm 30 years old, and that scares me. Money, or the lack thereof, is definitely on my mind. But I know I can make money in other ways. I know I can uncover other good opportunities. Perhaps I will never make as much money as this opportunity could have given me, but perhaps that's not true. I'm willing to bet on myself. The second biggest reason I stayed as long as I did was my boss. The guy that was willing to have breakfast with his mentee's friend. The guy that brought me in, taught me what he knew, and paid for extra training courses for me. This was a man that was not only financially successful, but generous, humble, thoughtful, and respected. He's a leader in his company, in his family, and in various communities. I am beyond grateful for this man, and he was looking to me to carry a big part of his legacy, to take care of his employees, and to take care of the assets for his family. So of course I stuck around for that. But it was also because of these things that I felt like I needed to leave. After all, he needed to know sooner rather than later if I was in this for life or not. If I wasn't, he needed to find someone else who was. And if I simply agreed to do it because it offered me financial benefits, meanwhile my head was in the clouds thinking about where I was gonna to escape to next, it would be doing a big disservice to him to his employees, to his clients, and to his family. And so it became clear that even the two biggest reasons for staying were now telling me that it was time to leave. And so this is where I am now. It's almost one year since I left. My boss found another young, hungry, ambitious person to take my place. Someone he could personally teach so that he has the comfort of knowing that the future of his company will be in the hands of someone who knows how he wants things done and who cares deeply about all of the people involved in his company. Someone who I also think is actually a really good fit for the job. Of course, since time and age are factors for my former boss, the process with this newer person has moved much quicker. Not long after I handed over all of my responsibilities and left, this new person moved away from the title of property manager to that of operations manager. And then just recently, he was in some new corporate photos alongside my former boss and with the even newer title of vice president. 
I'm not gonna lie, a small part of me sees that and gets this strange feeling inside. It feels a bit like a tinge of envy, regret, self-doubt, or some other negative emotion. But it's only for a second. I know that this was my decision, and I feel in my heart that even if I'm broke or I can't find a career, I still think it was a good choice that I can be proud of. Perhaps there was no right or wrong thing to do, only that I made a decision. And more than anything else, I'm happy for my former boss that he could find someone that would do well by him, his employees, and his family, even if that person's not me. Perhaps in a way, the process of finding me, three and a half years passing by, and it all not working out, was all necessary to get him to a place where he actually found the right person. I can't really know either way. All I know for sure is that I'm so grateful for this whole experience. The main challenge for me today is to keep those relationships with my boss and some of our clients alive. They've specifically told me that they want to do that, that they value our relationship. The only thing is there's this part of my subconscious that feels like I don't have anything else to offer them anymore. Like I would just be taking from them without having a way of giving back. So that's definitely something that I need to deal with. So that's my story. That's why I quit my job. And to be quite honest with you, this whole thing is something that I've kind of avoided for the past year. Like I haven't really given it the mental energy that it deserved. I think right after I quit this job, I kind of had a lot of self-doubt. I felt very self-conscious about my abilities and you know if i was letting anybody down and things like that and a lot of uncertainty about the future and so i think i just mentally pushed that aside until very recently like a week and a half ago i just sat down and really thought about everything i went through all the naggy complaints in my head and got that stuff out of the way and then i got to the point where i could kind of see things with a little bit more perspective and more gratitude. So just recently I've given this more mental energy and I wanted to put this in a video kind of for myself as, as like a diary, but also for anybody else that might be going through something similar. Somebody that is also deciding between like the idea of stability and career prestige. And then on the other hand, feeling like they're being pulled in a different direction and that their heart or their soul is yearning for something else and just kind of going through that dilemma. I definitely don't have all the answers. I don't know what the answers are for myself at this point, but hopefully this perspective can just be food for thought if you're going through something similar. So again, thank you for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this, please subscribe, send me a message on Instagram or on YouTube. And um, yeah, let's just get this community going of people that are looking for that next adventure in their life, whether it's work, whether it's travel, whether it's a, a relationship or anything like that. We always have to remember that if we look at things with the right perspective and with gratitude, when we're going into these adventures, we are going to thrive and we have to believe that. Thanks.